Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's conversation with Kamala Shamsi. This is the last event as part of the Wheeler Centre's Spectacular Mayhem series, and I hope you guys have been to a lot of them, as I have. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging, and pay my respects to the elders of any other communities who may be with us today. I'd like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded, and that the stolen land on which we meet on today always was and always will be Aboriginal land. A bit about me, I'm Sonia Naya, and I'll be hosting today's conversation with Kamla. Um, I'm a Melbourne-based writer and critic, and my social commentary and literary criticism has been published by the Wheeler Centre themselves, SBS Life, um, Kill Your Darlings and The Lifted Brow, among many others. Um, but on to our guest of honour tonight. Kamala Shamsi is the author of seven novels, which have been translated into over 20 languages. Home Fire, which is a book that we're discussing today, won the Women's Prize for Fiction, was long listed for the Man Booker Prize, and was long listed for the Australian Book Industry Award for International Book of the Year. Burnt Shadows was shortlisted for the Orange Prize for Fiction, and A God in Every Stone was shortlisted for the w Bailey's Women's Prize for Fiction. I feel like you've been shortlisted in three iterations of the same prize. <laughs> Um, three of our other novels, In the City by the Sea, Cartography and Broken Verses, have received awards from the Pakistan Academy of Letters. A fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and one of Granter's best of young British novelists, Kamala grew up in Karachi and now lives in London. Please join me in making her feel welcome. So we'll be talking for about 45 minutes, after which there'll be 15 minutes for audience Q&A. So please um, take the time to save up any questions that I might not get a chance to ask, because yeah, 45 minutes will go in the blink of an eye, I'm sure. But also, after the event, Heal of Content are our booksellers for tonight, and they'll be selling Kamala's whole back catalogue, so all seven books will be available if you'd like to buy them after. And she'll also be staying for a signing. Home Fire is a stunning fictional account that I was so lucky to be able to revisit after reading it for the first time last year. And I think what this book does, and I think, Kamala, you've said this in one of your interviews, it asks what it means in different moments to be a British Pakistani Muslim. It distills contemporary political issues like the notion of British identity and Britain's treatment of its immigrant populations into a deeply personal setting, one where the decisions of those in power have the ability to destroy lives and create discord. It is set predominantly in Britain, but I think in today's day and age, we face many of these same tensions in Australia as well. Home Fire is a contem contemporary retelling of the Greek tragedy Antigone, and like Antigone, it explores divided loyalties towards the state, one's faith, and one's family. It is narrated from the shifting viewpoints of five different characters, siblings Isma, Anika, and Pervez, British Home Secretary, Secretary Karama, and his son, Eamon. But I think nothing would give us a better sense of the book than you reading for it, Kamala. So I'd love you to read a section from Home Fire. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Thank you to all of you for coming tonight and, and to Helen for this invitation to the Wheeler Centre. Um, I'm going to read from the beginning, which has the advantage of not requiring me to explain too much before I get going. Um, and the only thing I will explain, because it may not be instantly clear, is that this is set um, in an airport in London. Isma was going to miss her flight. The ticket wouldn't be refunded because the airline took no responsibility for passengers who arrived at the airport three hours ahead of the departure time and were escorted to an interrogation room. She had expected the interrogation, but not the hours of waiting that would precede it, nor that it would feel so humiliating to have the contents of her suitcase inspected. She'd made sure not to pack anything that would invite comments or questions. No Quran no family pictures, no books on her areas of academic interest. But even so, the officer took hold of every item of Isma's clothing and ran it between her thumb and fingers, not so much searching for hidden pockets as judging the quality of the material. Finally, she reached for the designer label down jacket that Isma had folded over a chair back when she entered and held it up, one hand pinching each shoulder. This isn't yours, she said. And Isma was sure she didn't mean because it's at least a size too large, but rather it's too nice for someone like you. 
I used to work at a dry cleaning shop. The woman who brought this in said she didn't want it when we couldn't get rid of the stain. She pointed to the grease mark on the pocket. Does the manager know you took it? I was the manager. You were the manager of a dry cleaning shop and now you're on your way to a PhD program in sociology in Amherst, Massachusetts. Yes. And how did that happen? My siblings and I were orphaned just after I finished uni. They were 12 years old, twins. I took the first job I could find. Now they've grown up, I can go back to my life. You're going back to your life in Amherst, Massachusetts. I meant the academic life. The woman dropped the jacket into the jumble of clothes and shoes and told Isma to wait. That had been a while ago. The plane would be boarding now. Isma looked over at the suitcase. She'd repacked when the woman left the room and spent the time since worrying if doing that without permission constituted an offense. Should she empty the clothes out into a haphazard pile or would that make things even worse? She stood up, unzipped the suitcase and flipped it open so its contents were visible. A man entered the office carrying Isma's passport, laptop and phone. She allowed herself to hope, but he sat down, gestured for her to do the same, and placed a voice recorder between them. Do you consider yourself British? The man said. I, I am British. Yes, but do you consider yourself British? I've lived here all my life. She meant there was no other country of which she could feel herself a part, but the words came out sounding evasive. The interrogation continued for nearly two hours. He wanted to know her thoughts on Shias, homosexuals, the Queen, democracy, the Great British Bake Off, the invasion of Iraq, Israel, suicide bombers, dating websites. After that early slip regarding her Britishness, she settled into the manner that she'd practiced with Anika playing the role of the interrogating officer and Isma responding to her sister as though she was a customer of dubious political opinions whose business she didn't want to lose by voicing strenuously opposing views, but to whom she didn't see the need to lie either. There were long intervals of silence between each answer and the next question as the man clicked keys on her laptop, examining her browser history. He knew that she was interested in the marital status of an actor from a popular TV series, knew that wearing a hijab didn't stop her from buying expensive products to tame her frizzy hair, knew that she had searched for how to make small talk with Americans. You know, you don't have to be so compliant about everything, Anika had said during the role playing. Her sister, not quite 19, with her law student brain who knew everything about her rights and nothing about the fragility of her place in the world. For instance, if they ask you about the queen, just say, as an Asian, I have to admire her color palette. <laughs> Instead, Isma had responded, I greatly admire Her Majesty's commitment to the role. But there had been comfort in hearing her sister's alternative answers in her head, her ha of triumph, when the official asked a question she'd anticipated and that Isma had dismissed, such as the Great British Bake Off one. Well, if they didn't let her board this plane, or anyone after this, she would go home to Anika, which is what at least half Isma's heart knew it should do. How much of Anika's heart wanted that was a hard question to answer. She'd been so adamant that Isma not change her plans for America, and whether this was selflessness or a wish to be left alone was something even Anika herself didn't seem to know. A tiny flicker in Isma's brain signaled a thought about their brother, Pervez, that was trying to surface before it was submerged by the strength of her refusal ever to think about him again. Thank you. I love that passage because I think it introduces us to one of my favourite characters in the book, Isma, mm -hmm. and she kind of resurfaces in the beginning of the book and we don't hear from her again unless it's through the perspective of other characters, but I really enjoyed getting to know her innermost thoughts and, yeah, it was a great start to the book. I wanted to start this conversation differently, but hearing you do that reading, it kind of made me realise how much humour and levity there is mm -hmm. in this book despite the weighty themes that are explored. And I've seen a lot of people call for this book to be 
taught in schools and read by politicians, which I wholeheartedly agree with. But I think that kind of discounts how enjoyable an experience this is a book to read. And I was wondering, how intentional was it on your part to make the book lighter in some parts as you wrote about these very heavy and weighty political issues? Um, I don't know if I'd say it was intentional so much as it's my understanding of how the world works is that you know humor doesn't go away when awful things are going on um, and that in fact bureaucracy is ridiculous um, very often and, and the more awful it's being the more tyrannical and more unjust it's being the more ridiculous it is um, and that actually when you treat these things as though they are very very serious you're you're a, not doing your job as a writer, because that's not how it is, but you're, you're giving them a kind of authority, I suppose. Um, I think there's a great value in being able to point out the ridiculousness of the ridiculous, uh, particularly when it's about the abuse of power. But also, I mean, there are some characters in the novel. There's a character, Eamon, we meet later on, um, and he's just someone, part of his nature is he likes making people laugh. You know, that's who he is. So when he's there, you're going to have more jokes of a certain kind. Um, there is a point in the novel, I think, when the jokes dry up a little, um, when it became hard to, to avoid the nature of the beast. But, uh, um, but no, I mean, you know, my experience of the world is that very often in, in awful times, funny things are going on. And in that passage as well, it delves so much into the arbitrariness of mm -hmm. national borders, mm -hmm. and I guess how people of colour's passage is always contingent rather than assured. Um, I was thinking this dynamic affects you as well, because while you were writing this book, you were in the process of becoming a British citizen. Could you talk to us about when an interest in this sort of inequality first became apparent to you and when you became preoccupied with it? Oh, I was already a British citizen. I would not have dared write this book if I wasn't one. And that's something I was... I mean, it's, it's true, I was very deeply aware of it. Someone said, could you have... Very early after the book was published, someone said, would you have written this if you weren't a citizen? I said, absolutely not. Um, that there was a sense, once I became a citizen, of, okay, you know, it's not like someone sitting in the UK border office is going to look at... Um, not that I'm assuming that people at the UK BA sit around reading my novels. Um, <laughs> although, in fact, that I actually had a very happy um, story, because it's, I think it's important also to say that these things are not as, as one-dimensional, where um, very early on in the process of... Um, living in Britain, there was some problem with my visa as a result of a mistake they'd made at the Pakistan High Commission. Um, and I got a really nice immigration official who called up to kind of ask me what the problem was, um, and then emailed afterwards to say, don't worry, it's clearly not your problem. And I thought, it doesn't take that much, you know, and that it meant a great deal to me because I became instantly anxious, and he recognized it. And it just took him the time it takes to write one sentence to say this clearly wasn't your fault um, and I've written down that it's, it's fine and they should renew your visa. Um, and when you realize how easy it is for someone to do that, it makes it more egregious that, that you know, more often it goes the other way. Um, but because one of the things that happened was when I became a citizen, it was such a relief. Um, you know, uh, my friend Marion is sitting in the audience, and, and she is from South Africa originally. And when we, we used to talk a lot about this business of, of how fraught it was to be constantly reapplying for visas and never feel certain you would get the next one. Um, and when I got my permanent residence, she sent me a postcard I still have with a picture of a mountain that said Everest has climbed, um, which still sits on my fridge. And that feeling of security when you finally get that that passport, and you think, now no matter what, no matter what rules they change, I can stay. Um, but with me, I became a citizen in, in October 2013, and the next year, it was August or September 2014, um, and there were the first cases of young British citizens, or not always young, uh, going to join ISIS. And Theresa May, who was then the Home Secretary, um, which meant she was in charge of things like citizenship and migration, said, um, if they're dual citizens, we will strip them of their British citizenship. And I'm a dual citizen of Pakistan and Britain. And I thought, oh, not so safe that my citizenship, because I'm a dual citizen, remains contingent. Um, 
And so that really was the beginning of, of the novel, was this interest in, in this fact of contingent citizenship and how some, some people are unequivocally and irrevocably British, no matter what they do. Um, and others, it's more complicated. I also really like this sentiment that Anika, a character in the book, expresses um, with this phrase called Googling while Muslim, or mm -hmm. she shortens it to GWM, mm -hmm. sort of to illustrate the how it feels to be surveillance, like surveilled, I guess, mm -hmm. by the state. And you talk a bit about this while writing this book, that you were also wary of Googling while Muslim, to borrow Anika's phrase. Yeah. Could you tell us more about this? So when I started writing the book, because one of the things that happens um, in the novel, I mean, you know, it's a bit of a spoiler, but we can't talk about the book without talking about it, and there's still plenty else for you to know in, in the novel, is, is Pervez, the brother who um, she is trying not to think about in the beginning, um, he goes and joins ISIS. And when I knew I was going to write this, I, I did have this moment of thinking, well, I need to find, more, find out more about how these people were recruited. Um, and I thought, what am I going to do? Go online and literally write ISIS recruitment? <laughs> You know, and I'm so aware that I, I've just become a British citizen. <laughs> I'm from Pakistan. I'm, a, you know, from a Muslim background. I, re, am I doing this? And it was somewhat terrifying to me to discover that there was a part of my brain that was seriously worried. You know, there were there were two bits of my brain, and one half of my brain was saying, "Don't be ridiculous. You're a writer, and if this is what you want to go and look at, this is what you'll go and look at." And anyone who starts to wonder can look at, you know can look you up on Wikipedia and see your writer. Um, and you appear on the BBC, Radio 4, so you must be okay. <laughs> but there was another half of my brain that, that was actually seriously worried. Um, and that was sort of compiling, sort of, a, you know, was sort of working out, well, what will I say if they knock on my door? Um, and I got very lucky because there's uh, a friend of mine, the wonderful writer Gillian Slover, who was commissioned by the National Theatre in London to write a play on this very subject um, at a point when I was already thinking about the novel, but I hadn't yet started writing it. Um, and it was about young Britons going to join ISIS. And so she went around doing interviews with all kinds of people. Um, and we had a really interesting conversation where I said, you know, is it everyone in Britain living under the surveillance state who has these worries? Are you, did it occur to you to be worried? Because you're Googling all this stuff, you're meeting all these people, and she said no. But there's a, a young British Muslim man she knows who she tried to get to work as a researcher for her, and he said there is no way I can, I can go and research this stuff. Um, so she said no, it, it is very much about, you know, what kind of Britain you are. Um, so yeah, so I was, I was very aware. Um, and it was worrying to me how much I was aware of it. But then, of course, it became a thing that I could work into the novel. So Googling while Muslim was born. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know if that term has caught on with...? Um, I, I, it's, it's been very nice. I've had quite a few uh, British Muslims come up to me and say, did that phrase already exist? And I said, no. And they said, it's, an, it's amazing it didn't already exist, <laughs> but it does now. So, yeah. <laughs> So home fire is set amongst the rise of the Islamic State, but mm -hmm. I know you haven't shied away from tumultuous political moments in your other books. Mm -hmm. So Burnt Shadows takes us to Nagasaki when the nuclear bomb is dropped, and it also takes us to the partition of India and Pakistan. I was wondering what draws you to exploring these particular moments in your fiction? Um, probably growing up in Pakistan. <laughs> you know, I mean, the idea that the idea that um, the political is somehow separate from people's personal lives is not an idea that you know, I, I ever had. But also, I'm interested in history. I mean, not every Pakistani is going to write about things like this. Um, history and politics are things that I'm interested in. But also that you know, the world is a very peculiar place um, and seems to be getting ever more peculiar. And for me, writing a novel is the best way I know of trying to understand something. So when there's something that is going on that I can't quite figure out, or it's sort of a, you know, I want to know more about this, I want to understand it better, I go and write a novel. Um, and I suppose it just tells you the kinds of things that I'm trying to figure out more than anything else. Yeah, sure. So to change tact slightly, mm -hmm. this book is a contemporary retelling of Antigone, mm -hmm. and I know the idea came to you because a British playwright mm -hmm. suggested you write a play, but you wrote a novel instead because mm -hmm. you're a novelist. 
And I was wondering how, I find it really interesting that you've used this very fundamental text in the Western canon to centre this immigrant story. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what liberties using Antigone as sort of a mould allowed you in telling this story. Well, first of all, a lot of people say this thing about the Western canon, um, to which my point is, you know, the Greeks were in India for 200 years. The Indo-Greek kingdoms were there longer than the British Empire. Um, and you have um, scenes from Antigone on Gandhara art in ancient um, India going back to the first century BC, I think, or AD. So actually, I don't think of it as part of the Western canon. Um, <laughs> And so I didn't really think of it in those terms at all. I just thought um, when it was, um, you know, as you mentioned, a man called Jitinder Verma who runs um, a theatre in London called Tara Arts called me and said, I like your novels, I like how you do dialogue. Write me a play. Um, I said, I don't know how to write a play. He said, well, then rewrite one. He said, he's, and he said at this point, this was 2014, he said, you know, Greek tragedy is having a real revival on the London stage and something like Antigone in a contemporary context could be quite interesting. Um, and I said, oh yeah, that could be interesting. And, and really what I was thinking was, which one is Antigone? <laughs> <laughs> I'd read in university, I had no memory. And, and as I recall it, I got onto the train going back home and literally went to Wikipedia. I'm sorry, you know. I, I say this at university sometimes and all the professors just glare at me because of course it's not what students are supposed to be told that you go into Wikipedia looking for answers. Um, I went to Wikipedia and as I said, this was August, September 2014. It was within, it was three, because uh, I looked up the dates, it was three weeks after Theresa May had said for the first time, we will strip of citizenship the dual nationals who go. Um, and when I first looked at, the, um, at Antigone and I thought, I can't do this as a contemporary play because central to Antigone, for those of you who like me are thinking, which one is Antigone? Central to, the Antig to Antigone is the idea that there's a man who rebelled against the state, he fought against the state, and as a result, the, the king, the ruler said, his body will not be buried as a punishment to him and as a sign to other would-be traitors. And I thought, well, you know, you can't, in a contemporary London say this body will not be buried, you know, for hygiene laws, if for no other reason. And then I thought, what are you saying when you say this body cannot be buried here? You're, you're saying in life or in death, you have no claim to this land. And I thought, oh, that's like stripping someone of citizenship. And, and that was the moment I thought, you know, I can, I can do this. I can see instantly the kind of story I want to attach. Um, but in terms of the liberties it gave me, it was really interesting, Sonia, because when I started, I thought, well, you know, I'll use Antigone to some point till it's, as it's useful, but I'll probably not use most of it because I have to, this has to work as a novel. Um, and so anything in Antigone that doesn't work, I'll just get rid of. Um, and then I found that that play is just almost everything in it in one way or the other did work. Um, but I think the greatest thing it gave me is because it's, it's a very slim play. And there was something in the spareness of it that I think went into the language and the right, because this is the most sort of spare prose I've ever written, um, in a sense. So it's not about what, I mean, I didn't think in terms of what freedom and liberties, but um, there were certain ways in which it worked its way into the manner in which I told the story. There's an air of inevitability with Home Fire, I feel, in the way that Pavez encapsulates beautifully in this quote. He didn't know how to break out of these currents of history, how to shake free of the demons he had attached to his own heels. And I was wondering how much of that was influenced by the Greek tragedy that you were remodelling the story after and how much of it was due to your own feelings about, I guess, the seemingly immutable nature of national borders and the inheritance of loss that these characters have dealt with in the book. Um... You know, I don't believe in in fate and destiny. And I, I mean, I think it is important that one of the things he, he talked about is the demons he's attached to his own heels. Um, but what I am very interested in is this idea of consequences. Um, and at what point, whether it's in our personal lives or whether it's in the history of nations, you get to a point where it's too late to avoid the consequences of earlier actions. Um, and it's a question, I think we are now living in many parts of the world with all kinds of consequences. Um, you know, how did we come to this moment? The way to understand whichever country you're in 
how did we come to this moment, is to look at the moments before um, and the things we allowed and the things we swept under the rug, uh, the things we didn't stand up against enough. And that notion of, you know, at a certain point you will have to pay the price um, or those around you will have to pay the price, but there is always a price to be paid when you are making one bad decision after another. Um, but of course it's more complicated than that because the reason you're being making those bad decisions may be because of something that was visited upon you from you know an earlier an earlier generation as in his case um, so it's I wanted to have different stories in there because I also want to show that there are other ways of being also though that it's not that because he is born within a certain family in a certain country, this is the only thing that could have happened. Um, that there were other ways of being, and his sisters show other ways of being. And I noticed in Home Fire, there were many parallels with the character of Raza in Burnt Shadows, mm -hmm. in the way in which you focused on disenfranchised young men who are very lost for completely separate reasons. Mm -hmm. So Raza in Burnt Shadows has a very active and involved father figure compared to Purvey's in Home Fire. And I wanted to ask you, what draws you to exploring these young men's, I guess, upbringings and the way in which they become socialised into the world? Um, I suppose part of it, well, it's very hard to not look at um, the cost of young men being told that there are certain ways to be a man. Um, and that if you aren't fil fulfilling those roles, there's a problem. Um, or you're somehow failing. Um, and this sense of, and also a sense of wanting to belong and what it means when you don't belong, um, or you don't feel yourself to belong, the kind of ways in which you're made vulnerable. Um, they're very different though in, in as much as Reza gets himself into a bad situation, but actually his intentions are just to have a kind of adventure. Ideologically, he's never drawn in, you know, there are certain places he ends up, but ideologically he's never drawn there. Um, it's more that he's, having fun to some degree, there's a sense of wanting to escape. Um, but he's never, he doesn't make the, the kinds of absolute wrong decision that Pervez does. Um, and so there is, I think, sort of significant differences. But yeah, there, there is this story of um, what it means to be a, a young man. And, and when I was, um, when Home Fire came out, I was talking to a friend of mine who also, was also interviewing me about the book. Um, and we were talking about this idea of, of being, the different ways of being a boy and a girl. Um, you know, now that you have Kindle, you can see with your books that, that people will annotate lines, will underline bits in your book. And there's one line in Home Fire that is underlined more than any other by a huge margin. Um, and it's a line which I think is, yeah, is Anika's, no, is Isma's early on, where she says, um, for, for girls, becoming women was an inevitability. For boys, becoming men was an ambition. I have that in my notes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a really good line. And, I thought it was Amy that said it to her, was it? No, she, 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 she says it, it to him. him. Um, and, or she thinks it. And when I was talking to this friend of mine, and, and I said, you know, there's something, this phrase, be a man. I said, there's no equivalent in a girl's life. It's not be a woman, doesn't... And he said, it's so funny. He said, as you said that phrase, be a man, he said, I felt the weight of it on my shoulder. I mean, I, you know, that, and I realized I have lived with this phrase, you know, and that, it, that if you are a man, it has this deep resonance for you. And he said, it never occurred to me that for girls, it just, you know, it's not the same thing at all. And I suppose that's something I'm interested in. You know, as a writer, you're always interested in not just the experience of yourself, but the experience of not yourself, or the, or the experience of, of what it is to be someone um, who inhabits the world in a very different way. So while researching the character of Pervez, you would have had to read a lot about the process of radicalization and what attracted him to the Islamic State. I think I've read you say before that you found quite surprising things when you were researching this. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us more about that? Um, when I started the book, I. I at first saw that I wasn't going to have the character Pervez in there, that, that in fact you would have everyone's responses but that he wouldn't. And partly it was that I had no interest in replicating the story told too often where 
there's a young Muslim man, he becomes angry, he goes and joins a terrorist organization. As though there is a direct line between, you know, angry, anger and terrorism if you're Muslim. Um, and I just thought that, you know, how do I, what do I do with this? Because clearly I have to do something with it. Um, and I started to look at research out there, because again, because the Googling while Muslim issue, I wasn't going to go online and look directly at um, ISIS propaganda. Um, but I was looking, the thing that was particularly helpful and, and was sort of the, the light bulb moment, um, there's a man called Charlie Winter who's done a lot of research in the area. And he had done a report looking at a month of ISIS propaganda in its early days. And I think the propaganda changed it as it went on, but this is the early days, which are sort of the days when Pervez would have been recruited. And my assumption had been, from reading newspapers, um, my assumption had been that what ISIS most used to recruit young men was violence. Um, and the idea that you can come and have a gun and exert all this power over people through violence and that it was appealing to the kind of young men who wanted to use violence as, as a way to pow feel powerful. And the fascinating thing in Charlie Winter's research was that in that month he looked at, Violence was, I think, less than 10% of the propaganda. Um, and that the, the one thing that occurred more than anything else was sense of belonging. Um, and so the top sort of things were sense of belonging, um, sense of purpose, that you will be involved in nation building, um, freedom to practice your religion, lack of racism. Um, so there's a lot in the propaganda of men of different ethnicities all sitting together happily, you know. And I thought, well, this is interesting um, because it is clearly, oh, and also stuff like we'll have, we have a great welfare state. Um, peculiar things like we have great zoos and we're very interested in animal conservation. <laughs> I mean, things you really wouldn't expect. And, and, you know, blood drives and people, pictures of people cleaning the streets. It's all very um, hygienic and clean here. I mean, all kinds of things. And you realize, but of course, Unlike other terrorist organizations, they weren't just trying to recruit fighters, they were trying to build a state. So they needed doctors, they needed teachers, they needed electricians and engineers and media personnel and, and all kinds of people. Um, and that's when I thought, oh, this is actually a really interesting story to be told um, of ISIS recruiting someone who actually has no interest in violence, but still ends up going to this most brutal violent place. And you mentioned that you initially didn't want to write the viewpoint of Pervez, but you did alongside four other characters in the book. Mm -hmm. Was it a conscious choice from the beginning to narrate the story through, the, through these shifting viewpoints? And how was it moving in and out of these different characters' heads, yeah. I guess, as you narrated this story? Um, there's this John Berger line, which is quoted by more writers I know than any other, which is, never again will a single story be told as though it were the only one. Um, and sometimes I, you know, I realize I come to the point where I start reading a novel and I think, this person has been reading that John Berger line. And, and I did that last year. I read a book, a wonderful book called Improvement by Joan Silber. And I just thought, as I was reading it, and there were all these different characters, and I thought, let me Google her and John Berger. And there she was quoting the line. Um, and I think that, that you know, in the last three novels I've written, it's all been different perspectives because I do think it's one of the most... To me, one of the most interesting things about the stories we live in um, is the fact is that 10 of us could be in the same room and seeing a story differently um, because of that angle of history at which, through, at which we see something um, or whatever other reasons. Um, and so I am very interested in how that one moment appears to different people. But with this novel, there was, there was a moment when I thought that I'm maybe I should tell it, maybe I'm going to tell it through Isma's point of view. And then I just realized there's too much she wouldn't know or wouldn't be present for. Um, and it came to me at some point that one of the crucial things in the novel actually is the things people don't see in each other. Um, the part of each other's stories we don't recognize or the part we think we know so we don't see it. Um, and how that can be particularly true in families. You think, I know my family member. I know what they're capable of. And because you're so certain of that, you don't see the moment they change. Um, you know, all these families 
where people went to ISIS. Sometimes it would be, you know, yes, they recognized already warning authorities, but so often it would be, but what happened six months ago, he was this happy, smiling boy, or he, I didn't think he could do that, or I had no idea she was going to. Or, um, and you think, how could you be living with someone and not know? And then you realize, well, how could you imagine that someone you knew would go and do that? Um, and so the not knowing became an important part of the book and the things people don't see in each other. Um, and it was through those multiple perspectives also that that, that idea of not knowing, I think, um, and the things you don't see came across. And one of the things I found most interesting when we get to Karamat's character is how he's been depicted as this unequivocal baddie, mm -hmm. but he has lots of shades of moral ambiguity to him. Mm. How did you approach writing the character of Karamat, who was quite closely modelled after what was happening in the UK at the time in terms of Theresa May's mm -hmm. laws and stance on mm -hmm. statelessness and citizenship, and how did this feed into the novel overall? Um, so I was using Antigone as a base, I said, and in Antigone, the, the tyrant, the king, who makes this law saying the body shall not be buried, is uncle to the dead boy and his sisters. And when I was thinking about it, I thought, well, obviously in, in the book, I'm not going to have him be, I'm not going to have the home secretary who makes these rules be uncle to the kid who goes and joins ISIS, that'd be ridiculous. And I thought, well, actually, but I'd like there to be some kind of connective tissue between them. And I thought, well, what if he's from a similar kind of background? So that like, like them, he's um, sort of British Muslim from a, or British Pakistani from a Muslim background. Um, and my first idea, because I knew he'd have to be, because of his policies, I knew he'd have to be quite right wing. And I thought, really? Home Secretary, who's from a British, Pakistani, Muslim background in the Tory party. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> um, and those of you who are laughing know that, in fact, now and since the book was published, we do have a Home Secretary who, to some really chilling degree, does, in fact, um, you know, fit into exactly those parameters. But, but what happened at that moment was I, I sort of looked around Britain, I realized that there were three politicians um, Sajid Javed, Sadi Khan, Saida Varsi, um, who were all from precisely this background. They were the children of Pakistani migrants. Um, two when the Tory party, one was in labor. And they were all three being talked of as sort of rising stars. Um, as I was writing the book, one of them, Sadi Khan, became mayor of London. And then a year after it was published, another one of them became home secretary. Um, but even at the moment that I was thinking about it, I thought, one is an aberration, two is a coincidence, three is a sign of something changing. Um, and if there are three, at some point, one of them is going to get to some kind of high office. So I thought, okay, I can do this. Um, and yeah, it became sort of then interesting to think, well, so if you want to do well in national politics and you're from a Muslim background, who are you going to, what are you going to do with the fact of that Muslim background um, in this world of extreme home, uh, Islamophobia? Um, and it became a sort of, you know, fun thing to think about. But um, because the book was written in a certain way where you have these different narrators and the la or you see the um, story through different points of view, and the last point of view is Karamat Lone, the Home Secretary. And up until that point, everything you've been hearing about him from other characters um, is not sympathetic. And Isma, you know, really just is very clear that he's a complete sellout, that he has no moral fiber. He's only doing things for uh, political calculation. Um, and I got worried at a point because some years ago I had been um, at an event and Toni Morrison was speaking and someone said to the great Toni Morrison, do you regret anything in any of your novels? And she said, you know, there's one of my novels in which there's a character who I dislike. And it's really clear when you read that novel that I dislike that character. Well, I'm the writer. I have no business disliking one of my characters. And I understood what she meant. It's absolutely not that she was saying you need to write likable characters because Toni Morrison is no one's fool. But as a writer, that is not your, your relationship to your characters. It isn't one of like or dislike. You're not sitting in judgment 
on the characters you're like because you, when you're writing them, you are behind their eyes. You are seeing the world through their eyes. You're not looking at them in some sense. Um, and as I was getting to the section where I was going to write Karamath Lone, I thought this, I'm, I, I don't know how I'm going to do this because I dislike this man. But it is one of the things about getting behind someone's eyes is you start seeing them differently. And, and I started to write him and instantly he was a very different figure. And in fact, the section, you know, his section was the one I enjoyed writing the most. Um, and he became the character I was most intrigued by getting to know. Um, and I wouldn't vote for him, <laughs> but I might not mind sitting next to him at dinner. <laughs> That's really interesting, thank you. And I think ending with Karama brings me to my last question. So if you have any questions, please um, think about them now and we'll get to you in a second. I think for anyone who's read this book, it'd be remiss for me to speak about it without speaking about its ending, but I'm not gonna spoil anything except to say that it's a really powerful and memorable ending and it's quite unlike anything I've read before. So I wanted to ask you, why did you choose to end your novel in this way and what prevailing sentiment did you want readers to be left with without spoiling it, if possible? Yeah, it's really hard to answer without spoiling it. It's really hard. I'm really not going to spoil anything But I you. need to ask about the ending. So I'll, I'll tell you the thing with endings is um, that... Well, let's just start with the fact, you know, we know it's based on Antigone, it's a tragedy, so it's not going to be terribly cheerful. I can say that much. Um, and... As you're writing a novel, um, you know, and you're living with these characters, and, and there's a point where you think, actually, I, I want it all to be terribly cheerful, because now I'm invested in everyone's lives. But if you're doing your job at all properly, the further in you get to the ending, the further you get to the ending, the more it becomes inevitable. That there is only one thing that makes sense. You start a novel and anything is possible. Um, but as you're progressing, what you're doing is actually, um, and it, you know, it comes down back to that word consequences. Um, you are discarding possibilities with every choice your characters are making or you're making for them. You are discarding possibilities of where the novel can go. Um, so that by the time you get to the ending, I, you know, a lot of writers say they have trouble with endings. I have huge troubles with beginnings. But endings always seem perfectly clear because you have written yourself to a point where only this will ring true and nothing else. Um, and I do, you know, a lot of writing is sort of, by the end is back of the brain thinking, which is to say, obviously you're thinking, but you're not thinking about thinking, right? I mean, you're, you're writing without asking yourself the question, why am I making this decision? Because at the back of your brain, it's all been moving towards this particular point. So there was, no option of another ending. That's so interesting. Thank you. We're now going to open it up for audience Q&A. If anyone has any questions, please put your hand up and ushers will come to you. Um, hi there. Hello. Uh, my name's Gemma. Um, I was born in the UK and came out here in 1987 mm -hmm. and I consider myself a fairly reasonable person but I remember when Trump was first elected, uh, my brother who is also British and two and a half years younger than me, he has a family and they were going over to America for a holiday and I kind of went into... Um, a hysterical mode where I texted him and asked him to make sure that everything was up to date with his passports and visas mm -hmm. and re-entry visas into Australia because we're um, permanent residents of Australia. Do you think that people of colour have more awareness of the causality of politi political events like that and the lead up to them? Because it seems to some people that um, they all of a sudden happen, whereas to me, mm -hmm. it felt um, just by reading, uh, you know, taking an interest in the news, it felt like things were moving in that direction. Do you feel like um, it's like that in Britain? Um, I think it comes back to that question of what angle of history are you viewing the world from? Um, you know, there are, when, when Home Fire came out, uh, I had quite a few British Muslims come to me and say thank you because so much in that novel reflects Britain as we know it and we don't see it in fiction very often. 
Um, and I also had a lot of people who are not Muslim come up to me and say, thank you, because we had no idea that goes on in the country we lived in. I mean, you know, you, you know what is going on within your particular grouping. It becomes a matter of personal interest for you to know as, and so one of the things, you know, when Trump was elected and I was going to America for the first time and I had all these people saying, oh my God, aren't you worried? And I, and I said, can I tell you, it was much more frightening during George Bush's time if you were a Muslim, actually. Um, when Trump said, I'm gonna start a Muslim registry and everyone, you know, sort of started falling on the floor in fainting fits, George Bush had one, he just didn't call it that, he called it Ensia. N-S-E-E-R, um, and it wasn't for American citizens, but it was for people in America, many of them my friends, um, who'd been working and living and studying there for a while, and if they were men between 16 and 65 from 17 countries of the world, 16 of which were Muslim countries and one was North Korea, then you had to go and start registering. And when that happened, people didn't notice. Um, when Trump started doing stuff and calling it by its actual name, people noticed. So you know, there are all these moments in history where you think, well, you weren't paying attention back then, and actually it was worse then, but I also know that I'm aware of it because I was in secondary examination rooms in America for a number of years every time I entered, so of course I'd be aware of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the things that are happening to your grouping, and I think this is one of the things in, in a world where there is so much information coming at us, at all times, and it's not just about fake news, it's just there's so much noise um, that it's hard to pay attention to everything to which we should be paying attention. Climate change, of course, is the biggest example of this. Um, you know, I mean, for how, how many years has that been a thing that we've been aware of, and it's kind of there, this murmur in the background that we, at some abstract level, know we should be paying attention to, and yet somehow we've been failing completely to pay the kind of attention we should have been. Did you research mm -hmm. the two sisters or did you make them up? Because um, some, of the, yeah. some of the stuff was horrendous. Um, it, it's very hard to, to, I mean, I made all of them up, um, <laughs> but there was, there was certain things you, you know from um, reading newspapers, certain things you know from conversations with other people, certain things you know from you know, living in London. Um, so if you, if you want to ask me about something specific, um, I can tell you, but largely, um, largely the two sisters I think were, you know, an amalgamation of imagination and having looked around the world and being paying attention to particular things for a number of years. There were two or three hands up here, I think. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there's a... Hi, Kamala. Um, I've loved your books since I read Salt and Saffron back when I was a student at Kinead. Um, and I was wondering, I mean, I've read all your books, but I was wondering which one, do you have a particular favorite? Do you have a favorite child, basically? And um, also maybe which one was the most challenging to write and why? How, how do you feel about your books? Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think probably, although I don't think it's my best book, um, the one that has a particular place in my heart is probably cartography, um, because I think there's a lot of my childhood in Karachi in there, so there's a, there's a particular um, kind of affection I have for it. Um, a Garden Every Stone was probably the most challenging, um, just because finding the structure for that took a lot of time, and there was, I managed to give myself an enormous amount of research in, in many different things that I, that I had to do. So um, trying to find a way to write the novel without the research weighing it down too much. Um, but as a consequence, it's the one I'm also the most proud of. Um, and again, I don't know that that means it's the best novel um, of them all. I keep getting told that Home Fire is the best. I don't know, it's very hard to think of it. I sort of think of it not as what it's like as a book out in the world, but what I learned from it as a writer and, you know, some kind of feeling of accomplishment I had after it. Yeah. Were there any other questions? Hello. Um, I just want to, first of all, commend something you achieved in Home Fire, which is 
it stays with me, it stays with me, it stays with me. Thank you. And a lot of novels don't. Mm -hmm. And I think it is because you did create each of those people. And so we are left with an unresolved, divided loyalty among them all. And I, I am glad somebody mentioned the two sisters because I found the falling out and tension between them very powerful so mm -hmm. that there is a sense both of divided loyalty in relation to the state but also within families. And um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think up front there are a couple here. I had a related question mm -hmm. about the the arc that the younger sister travels from. Um, We're going to try not to give away too much, right? And answer, oh, okay. asking this question. I mean, okay. I know the arc, so can right. you can you phrase the question in a um, way that? Uh, uh, well, really, it. it, it yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, imagine my difficulties in talking about this book. And me <laughs> coming up with questions. Yeah. Uh, well, I suppose... Look, I'm, I'm terribly sorry I don't remember her name. I read the book last Anika. year. Anika. Anika. Yeah. Um, Anika's... Well, you know, obviously there, there, there is a development of, of mm -hmm. each of the characters and mm. that last comment about divided loyalties. I mean, I think there's a shifting... And I, and I thought the politician mm. was not at all straightforward. Mm -hmm. I, th I thought he was yeah. incredibly interesting. And that his um, terrible... I mean, he has a terrible dilemma. Mm -hmm. um, and we haven't mentioned Amon, actually. Mm. And I, I, maybe I can just ask you to say something about him right. and his relationship with um, the other characters. Mm -hmm. if without... You can decide how much of a spoiler. Amon <laughs> um, is the son of the Home Secretary. And very early on in the book, he meets Isma, who we, we saw early on. Um, and that's really what brings the two families together. So on one hand, you have the Home Secretary and his son, um, and on the other hand, you have Pervez, who goes to join ISIS, and his two sisters. And they're all um, British Muslim children of migrants um, and, and are negotiating this space in very different ways. And Eamon is the one who, his mother is um, Irish-American. He's very privileged. There are all kinds of ways in which you know, he's lived his life sort of outside having to deal with any of this. You know, he, because the uber privileged can be its own ethnicity in some way, until you come to the moment when it's not. Um, and, and for me, you know, part of the book is, or what's significant in that book is, Eamon sort of realizing that what it means to be the son of, or the grandson of, um, so and so and so and so in, in a certain kind of historical moment. Um, and so, I mean, the, I didn't want the book to be about a conflicting loyalty, uh, about are you loyal to the state or not, because actually that's a weirdly abstract kind of thing uh, to grapple with in a novel. And, and a novel is always about characters and their relationships to each other. Um, and that is where the novel has to work, at that level of the intimate and the human. Um, and that's what I try to do in the book, is to have all these much larger questions get refracted through the very intimate and human relationships of people. Well, you did it incredibly well. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your book. I, I absolutely adored it. Thank you. Um, and I'm wondering, um, you talked about how an Antigone became a structure for your book. But I'm thinking, like, very recently there's been Pat Barker's wonderful book and a couple of others written by women. And I'm just wondering, is it something about this ancient structure that's universal that leads women writers at the moment to want to reinterpret it, or do you think it's just a, a coincidence? Well, I think what we've had in the last few years is actually a lot of rewriting by men and women. So you had Conto been... Um, doing the Oristai, you had David Van doing Medea. So it's been both men and women, but it's true that it's been probably, or at least the ones we know most about, are more written by women. Um, and I think it's a mixture of things. One is that, yes, those stories, you know, they do have a weight and a gravity. Um, and I think in the case of Greek tragedy in particular, I mean, someone said to me, or I'm often asked why 
why Greek tragedy is being retold so much. And, and I said, well, maybe it's just that the Greeks were so good at looking horror in the eye and calling it by its name, and we're recognizing the need for that. But I think if any, for any of us who are writers who grew up with all these old myths and stories, um, you'll often realize that the women in them are ripe for retelling. Um, and certainly that's what Pat Barker has done with her, uh, what Madeleine Miller has done with Circe um, and, a, and a whole bunch of others. Antigone is interesting because she's one of the few characters who is a central character, who is a very strong woman character um, within that world of the Greek classics. But, but very often, if they're strong, they're kind of witches or something awful and have to be you know, dispatched and then turn really evil and vindictive. Um, so I think it is about looking at these stories and saying these are the stories by which we keep telling and retelling, and it is time for us to look at how gender works in them in a somewhat different way. We have time for one more question. Um, hi, I have a question about process. I hope that's okay to ask. Mm -hmm, um, sure. I've been working on a manuscript for a few years with multiple perspectives. And um, the advice I often hear is about um, tracking the arc of each character. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, I mean, I presume you're so experienced in this that maybe it's just instinctive. But I guess my question is, is it instinctive or do you plot each arc or how do you work around that? Um, this book was different to anything I've done for a very long time in as much as, because I had Antigone, um, I knew a lot about the story already. Um, and so before I started writing it, I had a fairly good idea of what was happening. Um, so I suppose there was some plotting, but actually, usually when I write, um, and I've written from multiple uh, perspectives more than once, I just write and make a big mess of things. Um, and I think one of the really significant things to remember is that that's what first drafts and sometimes second, third, and fourth drafts are there for, um, is for you to make a mess of things, but while you're making a mess of things, you are figuring it out. Um, so you're writing a lot of stuff that may not work, um, but you're writing towards a kind of clarity. Um, and again, it doesn't always work. With A God in Every Stone, there, were, there was a day when I realized I need to delete the last 10 months of work. Um, you know, and that happens. Um, fine, it happens, you know, it's 10 months. Um, but part of the process of writing that, that way is that you're going to run trouble, but, but there is um, also a sort of a sense of discovery because you haven't pre-plotted, you haven't decided this will happen and this will happen. Instead you're saying, as the characters are, are revealing themselves to you, you're allowing the story to move with the characters as they are becoming more human and fleshed out. Um, so there are advantages to both ways. Um, so I'm gonna be incredibly unhelpful to you um, <laughs> by saying I don't know because every one of my books in some way or the other has a slightly different process to the one before and part of it is just figuring out what the process is for this one. Um, but I would say don't worry about messing up. It really is what early drafts are for and, and the thing that keeps me sane as a writer is the line you can rewrite this. I think that's a really nice note to end on and the clock is flashing at me, so. Very alarmingly it's fra flashing It is, red. it looks yeah, like a good. fire alarm. Yeah. Um, so Hill of Content are selling all of Camilla's back catalogue and she'll be signing books as well. Please put your hands together. To Thank you very much. <laughs>